Today we'll be talking about cell complexes, the sort of Legos when it comes to building topological spaces. So let's get right into it. We want to be able to build topological spaces using building blocks. And to know how to attach those building blocks, we need to specify a certain type or set of morphisms. So we call the standard um, canonical boundary inclusions into the N-disk um, the set of standard topological generating cofibrations. So how do we actually attach these um, building blocks, which are the end disks? Well, we can visualize it as a push-out. And so all this diagram is saying is that we're attaching the disk to the topological space X um, along the boundary. So on the right, you know, if that yellow line is where we want to attach the boundary of the disk to, um, that's what we do. We call the end product after doing so many of these attachments a topological relative cell complex. Relative because we started from a space X and then we attached cells onto it. We could attach a finite or even infinite amount of these cells. What would happen in the infinite case is that we would consider this relative cell complex to just be a transfinite composition of co-products of these generating co-fibrations. Why co-products? Well, it might be the case that we want to attach more than one n-dimensional cell. We might want to attach like two n-dimensional cells, three n plus one dimensional cells, and in that case we would need to use co-products. Now a topological space is a cell complex if the function from the empty set to x is a relative cell complex. So again, a relative cell complex is a function uh, just a cell complex is a space and what this is really saying, you know, is that we're constructing the space Just from these cells. So we don't start from some space X Which is why we don't have that relative part on it. But again, there's a difference the relative cell complex is a function technically speaking and a um, cell complex is a space now, a finite relative cell complex, as you would imagine, is obtained from a finite number of cell attachments. And a CW complex is one in which the transfinite composition is countable. So you might recall that CW complexes have very nice properties. I think we mentioned like Whitehead's theorem, CW approximation. So it turns out that we don't need the um, composition to be finite. Um, we can actually work with it if it's a countable composition. So this was just a technicality that I brushed over earlier. A cell complex technically is a function with the information regarding its particular cell attachments, but more often than not, we mean a topological space for which there just exists some, um, some functions or some uh, relative cell complex. Our next result is a technical one, which we'll use later in the proof of another lemma. It says that every compact subspace of a topological cell complex intersects a finite number of cells. So let's start with the proof. We want to start by choosing a topological space Y and a compact subset of it. Then we want to pick a subset P of Y by choosing one point in the interior of the intersection with C of each of the cells of Y that intersects C. So if C intersects five cells, we would have five elements of P. And the reason we're doing this is the observation that compact implies um, complete. So if we have a subsequence, then that subsequence will converge. So P, if it has an accumulation point or if it converges, then it's a um, th that would imply that um, P is infinite. But if it doesn't, then it couldn't be infinite because every infinite subsequence would converge. So then we would be led to conclude that it's finite. Now let's see B and C. If C is a zero cell, let UC represent the topological space consisting of one element, namely C. Otherwise, write EC for the unique cell of Y containing C in its interior. Now, there's only one point of P in the interior of EC by construction. So we can construct a, or say that there exists an open neighborhood, um, UC containing C, that contains no points of P beyond possibly C itself, which would occur precisely in the case that um, 
C is the chosen point in P of, yeah, if C is in P. The reason we're doing this is because if we can show that we can enlarge this open set UC to some open set in open subset of the entire topological cell complex, then this would show that no point in P is an accumulation point because an open subset or an open set around the accumulation point should at least contain other elements of P. This clever construction is how we do this. So you can look at the details here, but the idea is that we're extending this open neighborhood to an open subset of the next step of the attachment. So one dimension higher, and we want to keep going higher and higher. So this construction ensures that we still have UC if we were to intersect it, you know, only considering the stage where the cell EC presented itself. But it also ensures that the intersection with P consists either of the empty set or the single element C. And one of the benefits of this construction is that we can impose the following partial order. The reason we wanted to have a partial order was to show that we can extend this all the way, we can extend this open neighborhood that we had originally around C constructively all the way up to the full cell complex, which happens at the stage gamma. So using this technical result, Zorn's lemma, um, we can say that there is a maximal element for um, any chain, and so there's a maximal element for the entire set T. And um, what we want to show is that that maximal element is precisely that open subset that happens at the stage gamma. Now the only other case would be that that maximal element presents itself before gamma. And that would be a problem because then our enlarged open subset around C wouldn't actually be an open subset of the entire cell complex. It would be a subset, an open subset of a subcell complex. So we're, we're going to be ar arguing this by contradiction. So assume that this maximal element presents itself before the stage gamma. A contradiction will arise because then we'll be able to construct an element of T larger than our assumed maximal element. And this makes sense because we're assuming that this presents itself before the entire full cell complex is presented. The precise way in which we construct this becomes um, pretty um, basic if you just think about it for a second. Um, basically, we just need to make sure that all of our requirements that we put on the set T are still fulfilled. And um, essentially, the outcome is that we can find um, an element in T that's just like one dimension higher. And so that would mean that our assumed maximum element couldn't be a maximal element because we could just go one higher. Now, obviously, that wouldn't be the case if our maximal element happened at gamma, because there's nothing after gamma. Now it'll become immediately useful to have the vocabulary to talk about um, what we call relative K cell complexes. So if you recall that a relative cell complex was defined as pushouts utilizing morphisms from generating um, co-fibrations. But what if we just had a different class of morphisms that we wanted in place of itope? Um, that's precisely what a relative K cell complex is. One such other class of morphisms that we'd like to construct relative cell complexes from is JTOPE, the set of standard topological generating acyclic cofibrations. Acyclic here just refers to the fact that um, these are weak homotopy equivalences, so maps out of cycles. Um, or, you know, spheres just are uh, null homotomic, they're just trivial. Um, so but when I say maps out of spheres, you can also just visualize this as um, representatives of homotopy groups, right? Because the requirements on homotopy groups that the boundaries get mapped to a single point make them analogous to maps um, out of a sphere. So this has immediate applications. For example, the inclusion of a CW complex into its standard cylinder object is a JTOPE relative cell complex. Now you might think, like on the surface, this is a pretty 
on basic observation because couldn't we just erect cylinders over all of the cells, which are end disks, and then that would just be a JTOP relative cell complex. And this is the right idea, but it only works so well in the zero dimensional case. So as you would expect, over all zero cells, we can erect a standard cylinder object, which is just D1. Um, yeah, and it works for the zero dimensional case. The problem with higher dimensions, so um, I should just say we're using induction, so assume this for all n, and let's work with the n to plus one dimensional case. The problem is that the boundary of the n plus one disk changed because um, its boundary was an n dimensional um, cell and we erected a cylinder over it. So its boundary changed and we can't just um, right away um, say that we can erect a cylinder over it. But if we observe what um, that cylinder is, um, so the cylinder over the boundary is just like a um, cylinder over the n plus one disk, but with no interior and the top end removed. In other words, it's just homeomorphic to the n plus one disks. So in fact, we don't run into any problems in erecting the cylinder after making this observation. Another simple observation we can make is that elements of JTOP are in fact ITOP relative cell complexes. Now this is a relatively simple proof just looking at the diagrams and what I've written here, but I think going through it illustrates a good way to think about how we are going to construct proofs um, <clears throat> of this kind. So um, it's often just about arranging these diagrams in such a way that we get the desired maps we want. In this case, we want the left side of push-out diagrams to be itope morphisms, and we want you know, the, to start in the top right with dn and end in the bottom right with dn plus one. And in this case, it's just a matter of you know doing one after the other. Our final lemma for this section is that every jtope relative cell complex is in fact a weak homotopy equivalence. So to see this, we're going to have to do two steps. First show that this is the case and for finitely many um, attachments, and then show that it's enough to just consider the finite case. So let x to x hat be a JTOP relative cell complex. Again, we can visualize each state, stage as a pushout, um, like this diagram. But consider that the projection and that the inclusion are inverses of each other. So if we stack these two, we get that the long vertical map on the right hand side is just the identity. So the two horizontal maps on the right hand side are equal, and that makes the rightmost vertical map also the identity. I'll restructure this diagram like this because then we can easier see why we can apply the universal property to see that we can actually factor the identity map. In fact, this shows that the map from x beta to x beta plus one back to x beta is the factorization of the identity map. So not only, so not only is this a left homotopy um, from that composition to the identity, but also it's just a constant homotopy. In fact, it is the identity. It remains to show that the other direction, x beta plus one to x beta to x beta plus one again, is also left homotopic to the identity um, on x beta plus one. Um, so that then we will see that x beta and x beta plus one are weak homotopy equivalences. We'll do this by showing that such a hom left homotopy is induced by this left homotopy, eta ni, from the identity on the cylinder object over dni to the map which first does the projection and then the inclusion. So first the projection onto just dni and then the inclusion back into the cylinder object. So to see this, let's stack our diagrams again and then rearrange it and let's apply the universal property, obtaining an induced map from x beta plus one to x beta plus one. So at t equals zero, eta and i on the left is um, just the identity. So that means both maps on the right side from x um, from dni across i to x beta plus one, both the diagonal and the horizontal one are exactly the same. So the red map is just the identity. At time equals one, eta and i is remember the map that first does the projection and then the inclusion. And so what does this mean for that red diagonal map? Well remember that this is a JTOP relative cell complex, so if x beta plus 1 is obtained from x beta by erecting cylinders over all the dni. So 
Um, when we project and then the do the inclusion with respect to eta and i, the diagonal map from d and i cross i dex beta plus 1 is effectively forgetting everything about the cylinder and just considering d and i, right? Because we're projecting and then including, as opposed to the horizontal map which doesn't do that. So that red map somehow needs to do the same thing of projecting and then including. But like we just said, j tope relative cell complex erecting cylinders over the d and i. And so we can just define the red map to be one that projects onto x beta, um, effectively forgetting about that cylinder part, and then including back in x beta plus one. And since all of these, um, there's such a diagram induced for each time in um, eta and i, time from zero to one, we have an induced left homotopy between the map that from x beta plus one to x beta, um, to x beta plus one again, to the identity on x beta plus one. And so in conclusion, this shows that x beta and x beta plus one are weak homotopy equivalent. So in conclusion, all the horizontal maps in this diagram are isomorphisms. In, in the finite case, we also have isomorphisms in these um, maps going down. Why? Well, because they're just defined to be the composition of these, um, these horizontal ones and finite compositions of morphisms make total sense. So now I want to claim that it's enough that this holds for finitely many stages. And that's because of our technical lemma from before. So you, that was the lemma that said that every compact um, subset of a cell, comp of a cell complex um, intersects only finitely many cells. Why is that important? Well, think about representatives for these homotopy groups. Um, they come from the interval cubes, which are compact, and the continuous image of a compact set is compact itself. So the representatives of all these homotopy groups intersect only finitely many cells, which means that they're actually exhibited, um, all of them, after a finite number of stages. And so the co-limit in this diagram, um, the uh, the homotopy group of the co-limit is isomorphic to the homotopy group of x hat, and we're done. So that's it for this section. Thanks for watching. Next section will be about vibrations, and we'll be introduced to the last major player in the basic definition of a model category, the serif vibration. But we'll be talking about vibrations um, more generally.